Maybe to protect Marcella and Ariane, or maybe to wipe away his own shame for breaking his vows as a member of the King's Guard. It seems clear that Oakheart purposely suicide rushed the guards in order to end his life. Or, as I've been told, it was the equivalent of suicide by cop. However, his intentions are still questioned, but he had to know there was no way he was making it out alive when he charged. Still, there are other characters in the series that choose to kill themselves or sacrifice themselves for others, but do so in a way that takes out others with them. These events are basically murder-suicides. There are two characters that come to mind when thinking of a murder-suicide, Maester Cresson and Hobart Hightower. Maester Cresson originally didn't plan on killing himself. He was convinced that Melisandre had to go and was corrupting Stannis Baratheon, a man the Maester had served for many years and loved dearly. To that end, he wanted to poison her drink with the drug known as the Strangler. However, when he couldn't get close enough to put the drug in her drink, he slips it into his own drink and asks Melisandre to share the cup with him. Davos tries to stop him, but the Maester is willing to drink from the cup as well to take out what he considers a great threat. His life is worth making sure she dies. Melisandre sees through this and tells him it isn't too late to spill the wine, but Cresson won't back down. He is firm in his decision to die if it also takes out the Red Witch. After Mel drinks all the wine but half a swallow, she hands it to Cresson. Cresson drinks it, knowing he will die, and he does. He just didn't realize the Red Witch wouldn't be affected. Hobart Hightower went out in a similar manner. He brought two casks of wine to poison a betrayer during the Dance of the Dragons. One cask held no poison, and the other was poisoned. He had hoped to drink from the non-poisoned one, while the betrayer drank from the poisoned one. But his intended victim grew suspicious and told Hobart to drink first. Instead of backing down, Hobart drank the poisoned wine and praised the taste, even pouring himself a second glass because he was so committed to taking this guy out. Satisfied by his actions, the betrayer drank deep from the poisoned wine, and they both died moments later. Just like the maester, Hobart was willing to kill himself in order to take out someone he felt needed to die. Lastly, let's talk about suicide due to overwhelming grief. Eight characters stick out to me when I think of suicide from enduring too much. The first that many think of is Ashara Dane. While there are some that believe she isn't dead, most in the Seven Kingdoms believe that at the end of Robert's Rebellion, after Ned Stark killed Arthur Dane, Ashara's brother, and returned his sword Dawn to Starfall, Ashara in grief jumped from one of Starfall's towers into the sea, where her body was never recovered. Others in the Seven Kingdoms believe Ashara also had a stillbirth, and the loss of the baby and her brother, and also being dishonored by a man that had caused the pregnancy, resulted in her jumping. It is clear if Ashara did commit suicide, she did so because of intense grief. Whether that grief was the dishonor from a man, the loss of a child, the loss of a brother, or a combination, we may never know. If it was the loss of a child or loved one, this is seen elsewhere in the series. Maesters have mentioned a few people that have killed themselves over the loss of a child or loved one. Eustace Osgrey from A Duncan Egg Story lost three of his sons in the Battle of the Redgrass Field during the first Blackfire Rebellion. Eustace was on the side of the Blackfires, and when his wife learned that all her adult sons had perished, she killed herself in grief. There's also the tragic story of Bale the Bard. After being called a coward by the Lord of Winterfell, Bale the Bard, a wildling, stole the man's daughter. The Stark line was on the verge of being extinct until one day when the girl reappeared in her room with an infant. Later, that infant grew to a man and became the new Lord of Winterfell and his father Bale, who he never knew the identity of, eventually became a king beyond the wall. Thirty years later, Bale led the wildlings south, and the Lord of Winterfell went to meet him. Bale couldn't kill his own son, but still not knowing Bale was his father, the Stark man killed the king beyond the wall. Following his victory, the Lord of Winterfell brought the head of Bale back to Winterfell, where his mother, who had loved the bard and grieved to see her son kill his own father, killed herself from the top of a tower. The next five suicides mentioned are all Targaryens, two of them queens and one king. Their deaths involve at least one of the things Ashara is claimed to have killed herself due to. Loss of a child, loss of a loved one, or dishonored by someone. First, Helena Targaryen was the sister wife to Aegon II Targaryen. Aegon II had taken the throne from his sister Rhaenyra, who their father had said would inherit when he died. When Rhaenyra fought for the throne, a bloody Targaryen civil war occurred called the Dance of the Dragons. 
When a child of Rhaenyra was killed by the other side, her husband Daemon promised vengeance. He arranged for two men, blood and cheese, to kill one of Helena and Aegon II's children in retribution. After they broke into the Red Keep and cornered Helena and her children, Aegon II was absent during this, she was forced to choose which of her three kids would die. At first she refused, but when they threatened to rape her little girl and kill all three of the kids, she finally picked her youngest child, Maelor, who she had hoped was too young to understand. Instead of killing the one she picked, Blood and Cheese killed Helena's oldest boy and told the youngest one, You hear that little boy? Your mama wants you dead. After this, Helena sunk into a deep depression, unable to look at the child she named for death, refusing to leave her chambers, eat, or bathe. Rhaenyra took King's Landing in 130 AC, and Helena, at the age of 21, jumped from her window in Magor's Holdfast at sunset, dying on the spikes below as one impaled her throat. Though some call it murder and still suspect it was Rhaenyra who ordered her to die. Regardless, before her death, it appeared to all that Helena had given up on life and could no longer be bothered to take care of herself or her basic biological needs. Next, Jahera Targaryen, the daughter of Helena. After the Dance of the Dragons ended, Rhaenyra's son, Aegon III, was put on the throne, and Helena and Aegon II's surviving daughter, Jahera, was married to him. Aegon III was 11, and Jahera was 8. After two years of marriage and after the deaths of her brother, father, mother, and a lot of her family, she threw herself from Magor's Holdfast and was impaled on the spikes below like her mother, except she lingered on for half an hour in agony before dying. Her death, like her mother's, is suspect as there were others that wanted to marry their daughters to Aegon III. However, it isn't unlikely that she killed herself over the grief of so much death and being married to a child that hated to be touched and was in a constant state of depression himself. Being the daughter of the man that killed your mother probably didn't warm Aegon III's heart to her either. Next, Alora Targaryen. Alora was married to her twin brother, Alor. Alora accidentally caused the death of her husband, and this accidental death drove her mad with grief. After being attacked at a mass ball by three individuals known as the Rat, the Hawk, and the Pig, she killed herself, unable to handle her grief anymore. Gael Targaryen. The daughter of King Jaehaerys I Targaryen, the fourth Targaryen king to rule the Seven Kingdoms, and Alysanne Targaryen, Gael was a simple but sweet girl. Though the claim was that she died of a summer fever, the truth is that she had been seduced by a traveling singer who had left her pregnant. In shame and grief, she drowned herself in the black water. Her mother, Alysanne, didn't kill herself, but the grief of her child passing was said to hasten her death, and she died within a year. Lastly, Magor I Targaryen. It is unknown if his death was a suicide, murder, or accident. Magor the Cruel, the third Targaryen king to rule the Seven Kingdoms, was found one morning seated on the Iron Throne, dead, with his robes covered in blood and his wrists slashed. This was following the loss of his mother and his mother's blade, the betrayal of his forced wife, the abandonment of two of his Kingsguard, and few bannermen coming to his call to defeat his nephew who had raised an army to take back the throne that was rightfully his. Though Magor had many enemies and someone could have just as easily killed him, or he could have accidentally slipped on the throne, or as some claim, the throne rose up against him, it is just as likely grief over the death of his mother and the betrayals that followed put him in a state where he would rather face death on his own terms than allow his throne to be taken away. So if it was suicide, he in fact could have killed himself over grief of loss, past, present, and future. When you have characters or events that involve suicide, I our Game of Thrones topics for the month of October. After October, we are back to the north.
Towards the middle of A Dance with Dragons, the fledgling Lord Commander, Jon Snow, is recalling the warmer, simpler days of his childhood at Winterfell. All too quickly, however, his musings grow painful as he summons up the awful fates of each of his loved ones, and of the castle itself, now a scorched desolation. All my memories are poisoned, he concludes bitterly, before returning to his Night's Watch duties. Like the reader, John is changed by the atrocities that have befallen the Stark family. Ned's execution, the sacking of Winterfell, the Red Wedding, to the point where it is almost too harrowing to even identify with them anymore. The Starks were not just another family dueling for control of the Iron Throne. They were our heroes, our moral center, or so we thought during the days of our own sweet summer childhood. But now, they have become part of the poison memories which infect so much of this series. The ghosts we had invested in, rooted for, loved, and lost. One of the central themes of A Song of Ice and Fire is how this process of loss and grief can transform a person. Much of the thoughts and deeds of the novel's point of view characters are driven by this heartache. That is, by the knowledge that someone they love has been taken from them or killed, and the journey towards reconciling that knowledge. The most prevalent response from characters to this situation is, of course, a desire for revenge. To hunt those responsible to the ends of the earth, and to have them and all their works undone with steel and flame. But as Martin takes great pains to articulate, these crusades are just as poisonous as the pain that fuels them. Revenge does not bring peace to Martin's characters, no more than it does for his readers. For example, at the end of Book One, A Game of Thrones, we were stirred to arms when a freshly crowned Rob Stark declared his war against the wicked Lannisters. But all too quickly, the reality of that decision, the chaos and slaughter inflicted upon the Riverlands, made itself relentlessly visible. Later on, we witnessed Rickard Karstark's anguish over the loss of his sons, and how it led to the murder of two innocent boys, as well as a host of senseless sackings. Fan favorite Oberon Martell willingly delivered himself to the hands of death over the memory of his slain sister, a blood feud that his older brother, Prince Doran, seems eager to commit the remainder of their family to. Meanwhile, Queen Cersei compromises her court, her house, and her sanity to see the former king avenged and the current king kept safe. And of course, Lady Stoneheart appears at the end of Book 3, A Storm of Swords, as the walking embodiment of grief reborn as murderous rage, a mother who did everything in her power to avert war, who eventually pledges her body and soul to the evisceration of living things, smearing her internal agony across a rotting landscape. The dynasties of Westeros have been raised and ruined by these self-perpetuating acts of retribution, acts which seem to universally stem from an inability to process loss. While many of us might regard grief as a painful but ultimately placid emotion, for Martin and his characters, it has the potential to be self-consuming and world-consuming. Robert Baratheon is a good case study in this process because his reaction to the loss of his betrothed, Lyanna Stark, quite literally reshaped the world around him. There were, of course, numerous political factors for the incitement of Robert's rebellion, but the alleged abduction of Lyanna, and to a lesser extent the slayings of Rickard and Brandon Stark, was its emotional core. It gave the rebels resolution and urgency in the face of a superior enemy, and for the purposes of legitimation, served as its narrative framework. A noble warrior fighting an evil tyrant to reclaim his lost love, a cause that both highborn and small folk were willing to get behind. What is vital, however, is that Robert was able to satisfy his need for retribution when he slew Rhaegar during the Battle of the Trident. The vendetta was satiated, but the wound remained. Lyanna was never returned to him, and indeed, as we learn from Ned's inner monologues, it seems doubtful she ever truly loved Robert to begin with. But Robert certainly loved her, or at the very least he loved the idea of her. He romanticized their betrothal in the same feigning manner that the whole realm romanticized his rebellion. Moreover, her perceived perfection and reciprocation of that love formed for Robert an ideal vision of himself. Thus, when Lyanna died, a part of Robert died with her, and without a foe to smite and a maiden to rescue, the rebel king found himself without purpose or passion, alone in his grief, with only a jagged chair to salve his heart. The crown he had won was as hollow and unfulfilling as Rhaegar's dying breath, 
And so, little by little, King Robert gave himself over to that other omnipresent extrication from loss, addiction. The darker side of his indulgences exposed themselves on the day of his wedding to Cersei Lannister, when Robert became so inebriated that he convinced himself that it was actually Lady Lyanna curled up beneath his royal blankets, eager to finally consummate their love. As the years of his kingship rolled on, Robert became famous for the gallons of wine and mountains of food he would consume, growing drunk and fat and dependent. It became a common shape at court that when the problems of the realm were laid before his throne, his grace would compulsively retreat to the Kingswood for a hunting expedition. His taste for women was equally notorious, and as he grew older, Robert began to seek out younger and younger bedmates. Perhaps it was a desperate bid to keep the memory of an adolescent Lyanna alive, to constantly live out the fantasy of the wedding night they never shared. Ironically, Lyanna's untimely death spared Robert from ever having to face the truth about her possible relationship with Rhaegar. She can be forever retained as a pure object of his desire, and accordingly, her death serves as a justification for the atrocities committed against the Targaryens in his name. They were nothing but dragon-spawned filth in Robert's eyes, because they took away some essential part of his manhood, his memories, his dreams. In the conversation he shares with Ned before setting off on his final hunt, Robert seems to acknowledge that, deep down, he realizes that Lyanna's heart never truly belonged to him. Nevertheless, it is a lie he must constantly assert is true, for his own sake as well as the realms, because without it, he would be forced to look into the mirror and see a monster staring back. It is the lie which has been festering inside Robert since the day he was crowned, a wound that he has desperately tried to numb with endless indulgences and distractions. Like all powerful addictions, the ones that came to possess Robert in his final years allowed him a sense of escape. They allowed him to simulate a feeling of pleasure and relief, where he could otherwise only feel shame. They allowed him to escape the memory of Lyanna and Rhaegar, and the thousand respawning problems that he was called upon to resolve every day. But most of all, they allowed him to live as he once was, in his prime, at his best, when there was nothing but hope and promise ahead of him, when he was loved by all, and, more importantly, when he loved himself. Even if the feeling only lasted a few hours, Robert would chase it, and the worse his life became, the harder he ran right into the boar's tusks. Like all untended wounds, this one undid him in the end, and when Ned pulled back those royal blankets, his nose was overcome by the rank infection that this warrior king had been reduced to these long, winding years. The character of Tyrion Lannister serves as something of an antithesis to King Robert. In his prime, the first son of House Baratheon was a bold, commanding, and handsome leader of men, often loutish, but also charming and adept at making friends out of anyone, including his enemies. In stark contrast, the imp, as he came to be called, grew up stunted, misshapen, and scorned by all, including his family. But despite these handicaps, or perhaps because of them, he also developed a shrewd, calculating, educated mind, and grew razor-tongued with his own brand of acidic wit. Like Robert, however, Tyrion is haunted by the memory of a lost love, and by the heady concoction of guilt, betrayal, and self-loathing her presence summons within him. But where Robert spent his life nourishing the lie that his love was reciprocated, Tyrion has convinced himself, or at least let himself be convinced, that his first wife Tysha never truly loved him, could never have loved him, no more than any person could have felt love for the deformed freak who slithered into this world upon his mother's death knell. Or so he has been told, over and over, and over again. Tyrion has dealt with emotional abuse all his life, primarily from his father and sister, and has developed wit as a coping mechanism for deflecting the various insults leveled against him, and belittling his attackers with a palpably superior intellect, along with the occasional veiled threat. Yet despite his spiky temperament, the Tyrion we meet at the beginning of the series is more or less a decent person, especially in contrast with the other Lannisters. Being something of an outcast himself, he displays empathies for the, quote, bastards, cripples, and broken things of this world, and even when power is suddenly thrust upon him, he endeavors to govern morally and to better the lives of everyone, highborn and low. Nevertheless, he remains hurtfully aware of the way the world sees him, and often resorts to, quote, playing the monster that others deem him to be, because, 
as he outlines to Jon Snow, if one wears their weakness as armour, it can never be used to harm them. Not to mention the advice Tyrion's father offers him about fear being an effective tool in inspiring obedience. This may seem like a sound strategy, and Tyrion is certainly impressive in his ability to wield words as though they were daggers, but I would contend that, little by little, the armour he has fashioned for himself to ward off emotional injuries has isolated him, and chipped away at his essential moral core. The idealism with which Tyrion commences his term as Hand of the King is continually compromised by a fear of being seen as vulnerable or inept or impotent in the eyes of the court. At the beginning of Book 2, A Clash of Kings, for example, he has a high-ranking child murderer discreetly thrown into the sea, but towards the end of the book, he is threatening to beat and rape his own nephew, Tommen. To be sure, these words are only a means of playing the monster and subduing any further attacks from Camp Cersei. However, after he has been sapped of all his former power, at the commencement of Book 3, a freshly disfigured Tyrion ponders the possibility of carrying out that brutal threat or else being proven as the weak, stunted imp the world insists him to be, rather than the ruthless Machiavellian power broker he has attempted to embody. The Tommen question is one that conveniently never has to be resolved, but the fact that he entertains the idea demonstrates the beginnings of a clear moral disintegration, one which reaches a savage trough in his final confrontation with Jamie and Tywin, followed by the long, sluggish current of misery which frames his storyline in Book 5, The Dance of Dragons. The tragedy of Tyrion is that, like Robert, his greatest desire is not to be feared, as his father was, but to be loved. And while he might don the monster's armour from time to time, Tyrion continues to fantasise about a day when people will be able to look past his twisted features and see the hero of the story. Indeed, part of the reason he poured so much of his heart into defending King's Landing was because he thought it might finally earn him praise and acceptance. But instead, his mangled body was dragged from the battlefield and hidden away in some dark, dank little cellar, so that his noble father and comely nephew could be paraded through the city streets and cheered as the golden victors. They will never love you, he has to keep reminding himself, as the dream slips further and further through his fingers, and to hell with them anyway. And yet, somewhere deep inside, a naive little voice keeps insisting, but they might. It is the same voice who flirted with a crofter's daughter all those years ago, a naive little boy who enjoyed two weeks of bliss in a peasant girl's arms and paid for it with a lifetime of shame. And that is where Shay comes in. With his older brother Jamie rotting in a dungeon, Shay is the only person in Tyrion's life who offers him any measure of fondness or affection the only person who he feels he can be totally open with. As the pressures of governance mount, he seeks solace in her arms. But the fact is, Tyrion never truly sees Shay as a person, and neither does the reader, really. For all intents and purposes, Martin treats the young camp follower as a blank canvas, no different from any of the other hundred whores Tyrion, or for that matter Robert, has sought the services of. A vain, pretty, empty vessel for him to fill up with his fantasies and vulnerabilities, and most perilously, his unresolved feelings for his lost love. For someone who feels continuously abused and persecuted by the world, Shay allows Tyrion to simulate a feeling of power over his life, being able to stipulate what she does, what she says, what she wears, when she arrives and departs. It is a sense of comfort and control that he was so brutally denied fifteen years prior when he was forced to watch his young bride gang-raped in front of him, and then partake in the crime. The trauma of that encounter lingers in Tyrion's mind to this day, and has had a profoundly damaging effect on his ability to form relationships with women. His fixation with whores is a natural reflection of this, not just because it allows him to reassert control over his sexuality, but because it reinforces a natural distance between himself and the opposite sex, and, theoretically, keeps his emotions quarantined. However, this ritual is once again upset by the overwhelming desire to connect with someone, to love them and to have that love reciprocated, and, as his subconscious seems to insist in the blurry days following Blackwater, to believe that those two weeks of bliss with Taisha were not a lie. So, little...
What is the self? Kind of a broad question, I know, and probably more at home in an undergraduate philosophy class than Tower of the Hand. Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. There is an art museum on the moon. Supposedly, we can't be sure until we go back and check, but as the story goes, in 1969, Fred Waldhauer from Bell Laboratories and sculptor Forrest Myers convinced an engineer working on the Apollo 12 lunar lander to hide a itsy bitsy, roughly two by one centimeter ceramic tile within the gold blankets wrapped around parts of the spacecraft that would be left on the moon. And etched onto that chip were artworks by famous artists. According to everyone involved, the plan worked. And when the Apollo 12 team left the moon, the wafer was still there. Now, two days later, Myers told the New York Times what they had done, and this image of the wafer was published. It contains a Rauschenberg straight line, a Oldenburg drawing of Mickey Mouse, pretty cool, and the story is likely to be true. If confirmed, that would make this wafer the first and currently only art museum on the moon. But the thumb is covering something. In fact, it's covering Andy Warhol's submission. Why? Well, according to Warhol, all he did was innocently etch his initials on the chip. He stylized them like this. He drew a somewhat funny W for Warhol and then put a line right across here to make this bit look like an A. That's it, it's just his initials. Here's an unobscured view of a replica. That's on the moon right now. I, however, am on Earth right now in North America, and this is a map of North America, which is cool because if you are in the place you have a map of, well, mathematically, there will always be some point on your map that is directly above the place in the real world it represents. Always. It doesn't matter how you hold the map. It can be rotated, flipped, even twisted, folded, or crumpled. It is guaranteed by Brouwer's fixed point theorem. A fixed point is anything that goes nowhere after a transformation. Brouwer's theorem tells us that it is impossible to completely mix up a set of points if they are bounded, without holes, and transformed continuously with no cutting or gluing. Without bounds, every point can be mapped somewhere new. Around holes, every point can be mapped somewhere new. And if you cut or glue, every point can be mapped somewhere new. But otherwise, mixing will always fail somewhere. A transformation is continuous if, as the distance between any two points reaches zero in the before state, it also approaches zero in the after state. Each square of this checkerboard is filled with point-like pixels of a unique color. As we transform it, let's have pixels still within the square they began in glow. Okay, as you can see, no matter how you resize or manipulate the checkerboard, it will always glow somewhere. You cannot get every pixel to be simultaneously outside of its original square, unless you cut or move the whole shape outside of the space it used to fill. Here's a question. Do you think you can completely mix up coffee in a mug by stirring? Well, of course you can. Not. Stirring coffee is a continuous transformation of the coffee and everything stays within the same space. So Brouwer's fixed point theorem applies. No matter how well you try to stir, there will always be after the liquid has settled, at least one point that you stirred right back to where it was before. A fixed point. 
To be sure, coffee isn't made out of points, it's made out of molecules. But they're quite tiny and very numerous, so within a degree of error, it'll pretty much hold. Fixed points don't just frustrate your ability to fully mix things, they can also suck. You toward them, they can be attractive, like the number nine. Try this, think of a number with more than one digit and then add up its digits. Now subtract that sum from the original number to get a new number. If you do this over and over and over again until you're left with a single digit number, you will always end up with nine, every time. Also, notice that any number with two or more digits minus the sum of its digits becomes divisible by nine right away. What's going on here? Well, there's nothing mystical about nineness in general. Instead, it's just a consequence of how we write numbers. Numbers can be written in all sorts of ways, but the most common, base 10 positional notation, makes the nine trick work. In this system, a number like 25 doesn't mean two and five, it means 10 twos and one five. That's 25. So subtracting out just the positional digits of a number removes one member from each group. The digit you have one of completely disappears. The digit you have 10 of goes down to nine copies. The digit you have 100 of goes down to 99 copies and so on. So the whole thing becomes a multiple of nine. Attractive fixed points also play a starring role in a famous method for calculating square roots. It's called the Babylonian method. The number you want to find the square root of is called the radicand, and its square root is some number that is equal to the radicand divided by itself, okay? Now, step one of this method is guess. If your guess is lower than the actual answer, the radicand divided by your guess will be larger than the answer, and vice versa. The true answer will always be somewhere in between those two values. So after you guess, take both values and find their average. It'll be a point in between. And now use this value as your guess and keep going. You will converge towards the true square root at a pretty nice speed. The number of correct digits in your approximation will roughly double after every iteration. That's pretty cool, but let's talk about infinity, specifically Aleph numbers. They describe sizes of well-ordered infinities. The smallest is Aleph null, equal to the quantity of integers that there are. But there are literally larger infinities than that. In order of increasing size, they are Aleph 1, Aleph 2, Aleph 3, and so on. Each one is infinite, but refers to a greater number of things than the infinity before. If you tried to pair up Aleph null things with Aleph 1 things, you'd literally run out of Aleph null things first, even though it's endless. You can hear more about Aleph numbers in this video of mine, but here's the thing. There happens to be an Aleph fixed point. Notice that the subscript of each Aleph is equal to the number of infinities less than it. There are none less than Aleph null, one less than Aleph one, two less than Aleph two, and so on. Each next Aleph number is monstrously bigger than the last, but only adds one to the growing list of Alephs. Clearly, these rates are so different, they'll never meet up. But they do. Take a look at this number, Aleph Aleph, 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 and so on, an endless cascade of Alephs. How many infinities are smaller than this number? Well, look at its subscript. It's, well, it's an endless cascade of Alephs, just like the number itself. This is an Aleph fixed point, an infinity so large, it is equal to the number of infinities smaller than itself. That's cool, but, Probably my favorite fixed point related thing 
is the borsuk ulam theorem. It states that at any given moment, there must be at least one pair of points on Earth's surface that are diametrically opposite one another, but nonetheless have the same temperature and atmospheric pressure. Diametrically opposite points on a sphere are called antipodes, and as I've discussed before, if you place a piece of bread on the ground somewhere on Earth, and another one on that point's anapode, well, you've made yourself an Earth sandwich. There are sites that help you locate such opposite points on land, but at this moment in history, you'll notice that most points on land are antipodal to water, which makes sense. The Earth's surface is mainly covered with water, but even though we know that, we don't always appreciate just how gigantic the Pacific Ocean is. Maybe because maps tend to cut right along it, dividing its power. But take a look at this. This is the Atlantic Ocean, all right? This is the Pacific Ocean. It's really more of a water hemisphere. The Pacific Ocean is so large, in fact, it contains its own antipodes, meaning there are places in the Pacific Ocean where you could float and know that even if you dug a hole straight down through the center of the Earth and emerged on the other side, you would still be in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, anyway, back to Borsicola. To see how it works, let's imagine two thermometers on opposite sides of the Earth, A and B. The temperatures they record will probably be different, but if we swap their locations, always keeping them at all times on opposite sides of the planet, their temperature readings will just flip. In order to swap, well, their readings are going to have to cross at least once. No matter how we swap these always antipodal thermometers, a crisscross will have to happen at least once somewhere. Moreover, these fixed points aren't just peppered around the globe willy-nilly. A continuous, unbroken band of them must separate A's region from B's. Why? Well, because if there wasn't such a wall, that would mean there'd be a way to swap them without their readings having to ever meet, which we know can't happen. Okay, next, let's pick a pair of antipodal points on this band and measure atmospheric pressure at both. If they're the same, hey, that's pretty good. Our job is done. But if they're not, we can just swap the barometers along the band. Like with temperature, the pressures they measure swap, so somewhere they will have to have the same value. Even though weather is chaotic and always changing, and even though the other side of the world is very, very far away, there must always be at least two places on opposite ends of the Earth where the temperature and the pressure are the same. This is true, by the way, for any two variables that vary continuously across Earth's surface. Four is often called a cosmic number. Why? Well, because, try this, name any number in English, really any at all, positive, negative, irrational, complex, uninteresting, surreal, infinite, doesn't matter. Now, count the number of letters in its name. This gives you a new number. Count the number of letters in its name and keep going. Eventually, every time, every single time, you will wind up at four, where you will be stuck looping forever. Side note, if doing something over and over again doesn't produce a different result than just doing it once, the procedure is called idempotent meaning same power. Taking the absolute value of a number is an idempotent act. Doing it once or doing it a million times gives the same result. Pushing an elevator call button is idempotent. Once pushed, it'll come to you. Pushing it again and again and again and again doesn't make it arrive faster or differently. Anyway, we get stuck at four because it's the only number in the English language spelled with the same number of letters as the quantity it represents. 
About four years ago, Reddit user Protocol7 showed that there are no other endless loops except four, and that while negative 15 and negative 17 both contain their absolute value worth of letters, which makes them special to be sure, they obviously aren't spelled with a negative number of letters. Four is four chunit. There's no escape. A path to it is forced. Oh, fork. It's even on my forearm. Well, I look forward to seeing you again soon. And as always, thanks for watching. I have some exciting news. If you are a parent with young children, or if you are a young child yourself, I have a video over on Sesame Studios that you should check out. Sesame Studios is from the creators of Sesame Street, and it's a great new channel full of really awesome videos for young people. So go check that channel out. Subscribe. If your kids use a different account, subscribe through that account or whatever you have to do to get stuff from Sesame Studios. It's great. Today I thought I would talk about the role of the French Resistance during World War II in this video which has been sponsored by our friends at The Great Courses Plus. More of them later. Now, um, I in my youthful naivety did buy into the idea that the French uh, Resistance was one big organised unit of brave Gallic souls who, who as one united body resisted the, French, the German occupation of France all the way through the war. And I was wrong. But I, I, I'd been sold a mythology, sold a mythology largely by the French. I do remember in my youth, uh, I went to uh, France on holiday with my family loads of times when I was a little boy, and I can remember that um, we went to a tank museum because, wow, well, you, know, you would, wouldn't you? It's got loads of tanks in it. And how much my father laughed at a video that was playing on a loop. I didn't completely understand it, but his French was better than mine. Um, it showed loads of pictures of a parade of tanks in front of a big clapping audience, and there was a history of World War II uh, playing. Um, and uh, to paraphrase, it went something like this. Uh, in order to liberate France from the dastardly Germans, the French invaded Germany, but having then found that she had been betrayed by her ghastly allies, uh, she was then forced to withdraw from uh, Germany. Uh, but she came up with a master plan, which was to go back across the channel to uh, Britain or somewhere like that, and then remass and then come back and liberate Europe. And that's what they did, uh, apparently. And, uh, well, it seems to work, so well done, France. And I can remember looking at uh, this parade of tanks and thinking, wow, that French tank looks remarkably, that looks remarkably like a Sherman. It really, I knew my tanks, even as a little boy. That looks remarkably like, oh, no, no, it's not a Sherman, no, because it's got French markings on it. Oh, that looks like an M3 half -tank. Oh, no, no, French again, I can see the marking. Oh, that looks like a British, oh, no, no, French markings again. All these. French tanks were being paraded, these French World War II tanks. And I remember my family used to marvel at the number of bronze statues there are in France of, of French World War II generals, as though they did anything of any significance. It's, it's, it's bizarre. But de Gaulle quite knowingly and deliberately, not just de Gaulle, but de Gaulle particularly, quite knowingly and deliberately fostered this myth of France liberating herself. Um, against their better judgment, possibly, the Allied High Command uh, were persuaded by de Gaulle to let him walk into the just liberated Paris as though he had liberated it uh, ahead of the Allied forces. And there he made a speech, um, one which, um, as he would on so many other occasions, stung the Allies with its ingratitude. He said, and I, I quote, although of course I quote in translation, Paris liberated. 
liberated by her own efforts, liberated by her people with the help of the armies of France, with the help of all France, that is France in combat, the one France, the true France, eternal France. Yeah, right. Thanks, De Gaulle. Uh, we believe you. Um, but in fact, De Gaulle didn't organise the French resistance. In fact, um, the French resistance was being organised by the British and they didn't even tell him, they didn't let him in on any of their secrets because French security was notoriously lax. If you told the French, then the secret would be out pretty quickly. The British actually had managed to insert 90 what they called circuits of F section, I think the F stands for France, of SOE, Special Operation Executive um, agents in France. Uh, SOE was later to become MI6, you know, James Bond and all that. Well, um, they managed to get the, these, these circuits set up within France and they would teach the locals to listen out for certain code words, um, code phrases that were quite surreal, real, you know, les singes dans son lazare stuff, um, and these would be broadcast after the news on the BBC. Now, you may be thinking, oh yeah, yeah, right, you know, you Lloyd, with your notorious pro-British bias, of course you're saying that the French resistance was organised by the British. You would say that, wouldn't you? Well, actually, let's be fair to the French here. The French couldn't organise the French resistance. They didn't have... Well, let me describe some of the uh, problems they had. France is really quite big. The entire population can't just take to the hills and hide behind bushes. Um, there are not enough bushes, not enough hills, and too many people in France. Um, the Germans, um, later on, uh, recruited men of fighting age to work in labour camps. So when, uh, in 1944, the Jedbra teams dropped in uh, to organise these, these recruited uh, gangs of men that were going to do the job, they were quite disappointed to find out that they had loads of 15-year-old boys and out-of-condition, broken-down, middle-aged guys. So where are all the guys in between? They were mostly uh, working in labour camps, doing whatever the Germans told them to do. Um, so the French didn't have the manpower, the French didn't have the mass communication ability because all these, these little groups of, of resistance all around France, how were they to communicate with each other? They couldn't use the mass media. The BBC could broadcast to the whole of France, but th they couldn't take over a broadcasting station. If they, if they used the mass media, they would very quickly be caught and killed. So they couldn't actually coordinate in that way. And what were they going to coordinate with? You see, if you just do some act of 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 vandalism uh, in the name of of the re resistance. It doesn't really do a lot. So you you blow up a load of uh, machines in the local factory. Okay. Well, what have you achieved? You've taken a great risk. You've put a load of factory workers out of work. They're going to really like you. When your family, if your family finds out that you took that risk, then they'll be thinking, you, you idiot, we could have lost you. And what's more, if you were caught, the Germans in reprisals would have killed all of us. So your family now hates you. And if anyone outside your family finds what, they're going to, they're going to be annoyed too, because you know, the reprisals were you know, quite often not just the immediate family, but you know, everyone in the area, and maybe they burned down the village. So you put all of us in danger. And for what? Those machines will be replaced or repaired, and after a while the factory will be working again. What did you achieve? You got everyone hating you, and you took a tremendous risk. What have you actually achieved? Not a lot. But if you had an outside coordination from Britain, coordinating your actions with some really major thing like the Normandy landings, then that's different because if you can get all those cells all around France, all blowing up trains and doing stuff all at the same time, right on the day of the Normandy landings, then that's going to be militarily very, very useful indeed. When your enemy is busy, that's when it's easiest to get away with guerrilla activity. And it's also when that guerrilla activity is most effective. So, um, did they achieve anything of military use? Yes, they also definitely did. Uh, they did so much damage to the railway network that it was, uh, that it was operating at 30% capacity when the Normandy landing breakout uh, phase was, was going on. So that's a great achievement. That made it very difficult for the Germans to move troops around. So difficult, in fact, um, that uh, the Das Reich, uh, for instance, division, one of the elite uh, panzer units of, the, of the, the, the German army, it was only three days away from the front, but it took them 17 days to get into action. They were so delayed by bridges being broken, signposts pointing the wrong way, telephone cables being cut, 
and derailed trains and so forth. Uh, the British dropped 70,000 tyre bursters um, uh, to, to puncture the tyres of passing convoys and uh, entire divisions of Germans ran out of puncture repair kits. Um, so yes, that was militarily very useful indeed. And at that moment, they showed what they could do. But the thing is that up until that moment, and even beyond it, they spent most of their time fighting each other. You see, there wasn't one resistance. Instead, there were loads and loads of local commanders who all wanted to be their, you know, their own boss um, and didn't want to coordinate with others because you know, they enjoyed being a boss, having their own little private army. Plus, ideologically, all these different splinter cells, they all hated each other because you know, some of them were communists. But don't forget that there are several different kinds of communists who all hated each other. You Trotskyist, you Marxist, you, you Leninist, you, you Stalinist, and so forth. Um, and they all hated each other. And then there were the socialists who, who, again, split into loads of different kinds of socialists. And they all hated each other. And they all hated the communists. And they all hated the de Gaullists because, you know, that's the other lot entirely. They just, ugh. So if you are... Uh, in the in the, in the Maquis, if you are uh, a volunteer in 1943, there's not actually not a lot you can do. You can't coordinate your efforts with the big push with Normandy landings because that's not happening yet. Um, and if you want to get some arms, get some weapons, you could you could steal them off the Germans. That's really amazingly dangerous. However, and there will be horrendous reprisals if a load of arms get stolen off the Germans. They're going to line up a load of presumably innocent people, doesn't matter, and shoot them against a wall. So, um, yeah, maybe, ah, I know, we'll steal weapons off a rival group of, of resistance, because that's much safer, there won't be any reprisal, so we won't be universally hated. And then, when the war ends, we'll be able to use those arms against the swines. Ha! Yeah, and this continued even when the Allies were dropping in uh, supplies after Normandy even, uh, it would still be the case that you had to watch out because as you um, were signalling to an aircraft and watching the, the supply drops parachutes come down onto your landing zone, which you'd carefully uh, prepared and lit with three beacons, you might be ambushed by another lot of resistance who would then nick all your arms and then perhaps not even use them to fight the Germans but instead hoard them for the day when, when the, the Germans are gone and then you can fight against the de Gaullists or whoever it is. And it's got so bad, in fact, that Allied High Command, coming right from, uh, from Eisenhower, decided that they would stop dropping so many arms to the French resistance. Uh, in three months, um, uh, July to September 1944, they dropped 6,000 tonnes of small arms and explosives. And then after a while they started dropping less because they thought great we're going to liberate a country which will then immediately just dissolve into a civil war because we'll have so many armed bands who all hate each other that uh, they'll all be at each other's throats and we don't want that um, and it seems that they were quite wise because well there wasn't a big civil war immediately after world war ii in france but perhaps there could have been now i was going to talk about the great courses plus so I will, just briefly. Uh, the Great Courses Plus is a huge online website with loads and loads of, well, it doesn't have to be history, science, cookery, photography, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, eh, give them a look. So, now, um, the British sent in the Jedbras. The Jedbras were uh, special operations executive uh, agents uh, that were there to lead the French resistance actually as combat units. Not as not as uh, information relayers, but actually combat units. So these guys were uh, they were sent down in uniform and they were armed and they would say, right, we're going to form units. And typically, a Jed team found itself uh, in command of about fifteen hundred uh, resistance fighters. And I have read of actions that got up to battalion level. So you know some of the actions were really quite big that they were fighting against the Germans, uh, besieged in in various garrison towns and so forth. Um, they did have a problem later on when uh, the Allies were going forward so successfully that the, um, there was a genuine risk of the irregular troops of the resistance uh, meeting the regular advancing troops of the Allies and there being some horrendous confusion and friendly fire incidents and, some, and so forth. And uh, usually what they would do is just make themselves scarce because you don't want to mix regular and irregular forces. 
Um, and uh, it did happen that sometimes forces of the Maquis would find themselves trapped between the Germans and the advancing allies, which wasn't a nice position to be in. Um, now, there were loads of people who were, of course, sort of in favour of the Nazi occupation. There were the milice, for instance, which is only one letter away from the word malice. And these were the secret police who were pro-Vichy, pro-Nazi occupation, who would denounce their fellows, and sometimes in a spirit of just petty vengeance. Oh, you know that guy over there who was so ungracious when my cow won best in show at the agricultural uh, competition. Well, hey, I'll denounce him to the Gestapo and he won't be laughing now. It seems that there are people out there who really are that petty. And of course, if you think that uh, he's a de Gaullist and you're a communist, that's another reason for denouncing him. Uh, even though you may think that they're both pro-French, yeah, yeah, these rivalries were so intense that there were people who would take advantage of the situation to harm their fellows. Now, the Maquis, of course, uh, when the Germans had been ejected from an area, were often quite keen to round up all the people they think had been collaborators and without trial quite often execute them. They killed a lot. They killed about 30,000 Frenchmen this way, which shockingly is about the same number that the Nazis killed during the whole of the French occupation. So it seems, you know, based on that, that maybe there was a genuine risk of civil war in France. And uh, so perhaps Eisenhower and the British uh, Allied High Command uh, did a wise thing in stopping uh, the arm arming of the, the Maquis, the resistance. There was never one unified resistance. Um, and uh, in fact, there were so many organizations that they were known uh, uh, to the SOE uh, HQ as the, the alphabetical resistance. And here, here are just a few of the, the organizations that called themselves the French resistance during World War II. This is just a few, this is just a few samples. They all have their own little initialisms. There were so many of them and they were not coordinated, but it does turn out that if you've got a large number of uh, uncoordinated rival groups who are doing incredibly petty things, like one of the things the British had to stop them doing was, could you please stop holding up tobacconists? But we can hold up tobacconists, we can get lots of cigarettes. Yes, yes, but it's not really very good for the, for the war effort, is it? Just holding up a tobacconist. Could you please just, you know, can we, can we fight the Germans? Can we do that? Um, yes, but you can make them a very effective fighting unit if you get them all to do something of military use all at the same time just when you make the big push with your conventional forces. And for that to happen you need an external organising force. The French couldn't have organised that. The only people in a position to do it were the British.